Tech for Seniors, episode 54. It is April the 5th, 2021, season two. Wow, welcome everyone. I was saying earlier that it's a, it's a, it's a difficult day for me today. Today is usually the day that we get back from Mesa, Arizona, but we've been here all winter. So anyway, uh, different times. I wanna thank everyone for coming today. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, this is a totally volunteer organization. Uh, we don't get paid for anything. Our payment is you. It's the enthusiasm that you have uh, with your uh, with uh, with uh, just under a hundred people watching us today that gives us the excitement to keep going. For those of you who are over on our YouTube channel, uh, welcome and thank you for joining us as well. The uh, show is a little bit different for YouTube. Uh, we'll be uh, continuing on for the first uh, 50 minutes, and then um, we'll be signing off just before the music segment. Uh, the show will continue on, though, uh, here on Zoom, and it will go on till the top of the hour, and then we will have a 20-minute question and answer. Uh, as, uh, as you all know, the show is taped, and it will um, be uh, available later on today for a full recording of the uh, both the, um, the, the show today and the, uh, uh, the question and answer period. I'd like to welcome, first of all, Huey. How, how are you doing, Huey? And uh, can you, you were telling me yesterday about your, WinSig's got something coming up that's pretty important. Do you wanna mention that? Yeah, uh, this, uh, the Sunday, this Sunday, which is the 11th, uh, the Central Florida Computer Society Windows Special Interest Group I always have uh, starting at one o'clock, we open the doors, we started at 1.30. And then right after it is the main meeting of the Central Florida Computer Society. And I was asked to do a presentation to SEMCO, which is the Southeastern Michigan Computer Organization Group. And they meet at the same time. So it can't be in two places at once. So I suggested to SEMCO that we combine the meetings. So what we're gonna do this Sunday is I'm doing a presentation on Evernote which is agnostic as far as uh, platforms, it works on all of them. So if you have a device, you can run Evernote. And so I'm gonna be talking about Evernote. It's a way to store information and find it easily and quickly. And then right after that, instead of the main meeting of CFCS, we're joining with Semco and they do a Linux SIG, which we don't have a lot of members that uh, are capable of running a SIG but are interested in Linux. And so the president of Semco uh, holds his Linux SIG right after their session. So he's going to continue on and he's gonna be talking about adding one of the distros or distributions of Linux. So it's, it's gonna be a fun time and it's two big groups combining together to have one meeting. So it's uh, something a little bit different and uh, it's open to everybody. So if any of you want to join, uh, just uh, drop me a note and I can give you the link to uh, register. You have to be registered. You will get a, a, a link for the meeting that is just for you. And please join us. If not, you can watch the recording. Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, Bob, I, I hear you're going to give us a uh, uh, talk on spring cleaning. Not only are you the vacuum expert, but you're also going to tell us about spring cleaning. Is that right? Yeah, I'm going to put the vacuum to use and clean up Windows 10. <laughs> okay, well, that's you. You're in for a treat today. Bob did a really good job in, in getting this organized for you. So you'll learn all about spring cleaning. And uh, then there's, of course, Ray with his new fancy smancy computer. Uh, what do you got to tell us about? It? You're wearing a seatbelt now, are you, or what? What's happening? <laughs> well, it's a, it's faster than I anticipated. I think I told you as the i7 processor, 32 gig of RAM, and I use the Windows Hello feature with the camera that uh, uh, not a camera uh, actually measures your face, etc. And I tested to see how long it would take after I press the start button, and it was on in seven seconds. Amazing, amazing. Yes. Well, you're going to talk more about uh, some of the components of that today as well, I guess. Well, in, in the future, for sure. But uh, yes, okay. one component in particular. Good. Okay, great. 
And Dewey, you are in for a treat today. Dewey has something really interesting to talk about. LIDAR and radar and all sorts of fancy stuff that you're going to talk about about cars today. Well, it's not radar, but it's LIDAR, AR, and maps and how they are related. Okay. And so uh, we'll do my best. I already have my next week's topic planned, but I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to handle it since we're packing to leave for Minnesota and we'll leave on Thursday. So, okay. We'll, well you can send it off. Send it off to me and we'll, we'll play it for you. Don't worry about that. All right. Excellent. Thanks so, thanks so much. It's going to be a great show today. We've got lots of very interesting things to talk about. Uh, one of the things that uh, we did this week, uh, we talked a little bit about this earlier, is that we did our uh, pilot this last Thursday of, uh, called Tech for Senior Live. And this is where uh, we just, there was Huey, uh, Bob, and myself, and we just got together for talk, just to, just to talk. We just had coffee and we just talked about things. And we used um, a program called StreamYard, and we streamed it to YouTube and um, Facebook. And on the Facebook feed, we've had over a thousand people have, have viewed the feed, and 120 of them have watched all or part of the, of the show. Uh, we had no, I, as I said earlier, I, I don't know what we talked about that was so interesting. It must have been Bob's magnetic personality or something like that, but... But they were, they were, it was like, it's, it's really quite phenomenal, the success. And we had a whole bunch of people on YouTube watch it as well. So it, uh, it turned out really good. So we're going to do it again on this Thursday. So if you want to drop by and talk to us, uh, that's fine. Uh, and we, uh, we do concentrate on that show on the chat because it's, it's, there's nothing structured. We just have our coffee and we just talk. And, and if you ask questions, we can answer them. So it's, uh, it's a bit different. This, this show is... Uh, is very structured and, and content orientated where Thursday is just us chatting. Um, I wanted to just briefly show you something before, uh, before, you, uh, before we move on, because as Tech for Senior grows, it gets more complicated as to, as to content. And I constantly get asked um, what, how you find things. And I'm just gonna share my screen. And I just wanna show you, this is, um, this is our newsletter uh, that I send out on Saturday. Now, if you do not, um, if you don't get our newsletter, then please go over to Tech for Senior and sign up and we will send you the newsletter uh, free of charge and it comes out twice a week. Um, if you look in the newsletter, you'll see right up at the top here in black, you will see um, important news that we have. And if you come down, you'll see, of course, our live streaming. If you just click this button here, it will take you to the live stream. Uh, you can follow us on Facebook. We have our Facebook page here. But if you come down, what I wanted to show you guys was this. In the meeting info here, uh, you will see two links at the bottom. And, and the first link here is season one and recent episodes. Uh, these are all um, the episodes of Tech for, Se Tech for Seniors. And if you just click this link, and I'm not going to click it because it'll just take us to the uh, all the list. Uh, I will in a minute. If you just click this link, you will take you to all the episodes of Tech for Seniors. All you have to do is, is bookmark it. And then and if you ever want to find us and find all the episodes, you just click that bookmark and it'll all be updated. That's all you ever have to do. Um, if you come down here and you'll see the next link that I've given you, is a link to the uh, Tech for Seniors other shows. There's, there's other products that we have produced that uh, are not, not our weekly show. And, and that was all mixed in with the weekly shows uh, playlist. So we, we now have created uh, a second playlist here. And again, if you click on this, you'll see, again, this is what you'll find. It will bring up uh, all the, um, all the, uh, all the, all the, product that we have here. And again, if you come over and you just click this little button here, you can, uh, you can bookmark it. Okay. And then, and then any that we add to this playlist, uh, you will be able to, uh, you'll be able to see. Now we will be adding another playlist on here uh, that will be, of course, for our Tech for Senior live show that we do. So it, it, that helps you find things uh, and just, and, and it's all right there in the newsletter for you. All right, uh, I'm going to stop sharing now and stop yakking. I think, Bob, are you 
Are the bad guys, I looked at the, the length of your segment and I think the bad guys are up to no good again. Fortunately, you got that one right. <laughs> Okay, okay. Oh, and I shared wrong. Here is the Avast Security News Roundup for the week ending April 2nd, 2021. Ransomware gang wanted 40 million in Florida school cyber attack. The computer system of one of the nation's largest school districts was hacked by a criminal gang that encrypted district data and demanded $40 million in ransom or it would erase the files and post students' and employees' personal information online. Broward County Public Schools said in a statement Thursday that there is no indication that any personal information has been stolen and that it made no extortion payments to the ransomware gang, which as an apparent pressure tactic last week posted screenshots of its online negotiations with the district to its site on the dark web. The Fort Lauderdale-based district said it is working with cybersecurity experts to investigate the incident and remedy affected systems. Efforts to restore all systems are underway and progressing well. We have no intentions of paying a ransom. The district did, after two weeks of back and forth, offer to pay 500000 at which point the ransomware criminals apparently ended negotiations according to the hackers' screenshots. GitHub Arctic Vault likely has leaked MedData patient records. The patient data from multiple providers appears to have been captured and subsequently leaked on the data repository GitHub Arctic Code Vault by third-party vendor Met data, according to a new collaborative report from security researchers Jell Ursum and Descent Doe of databreaches.net. Met data provides revenue cycle services to healthcare systems and hospitals, including Medicaid eligibility, third party liability, workers' compensation, and patient billing services. The data was discovered on the Arctic Code Vault, which is an open-source public data repository in a long-term archival facility designed to last for up to a thousand years. Through the research, Orsum detected throws of protected health information tied to a single developer. The impact data included patients' names combined with one or more data elements, such as subscribers' ID, social security numbers, diagnosis, conditions, claim data, dates of service, medical procedure codes, insurance policy numbers, provider name, contact details, and dates of birth. All affected patients will receive free credit monitoring and identity theft services. Mackenzie Scott Grant scam more widely spread than initially thought. Scott announced last December that she had distributed almost $4.2 billion of her fortune to almost 400 organizations in the U.S. dedicated to making a positive social impact. Emails impersonating the Mackenzie Bezos Scott Foundation continue to pour in, according to email security platform Iron Scales, who says the fraudulent messages reached at least 190,000 mailboxes. The messages purports to be from their charity organization, saying that the recipient has been selected to receive a grant. The alleged funds could be released after replying with some personal details, full name and address, and paying a small processing fee required for the money transfer. Cyber criminals are quick to take advantage of high-profile events, such as billions being donated over a few months. They are also aware that some victims may not pay attention to typos and grammar mistakes. After all, even legitimate messages may contain mistakes 
or be sufficiently nondescript to raise suspicion. U.S. DOJ Fishing attacks use vaccine surveys to steal personal info. The U.S. Department of Justice warns of phishing attacks using fake post-vaccine surveys to steal money from people or tricking them into handing over their personal information. Attackers promise potential victims cash or prizes for filling out the fake surveys. Instead, they only harvest the filled out personally identifiable information to fuel fraud schemes involving identity theft. Consumers receive the surveys via emails and text messages and are told that as a gift for filling out the survey, they can choose from various free prizes, such as an iPad Pro, the DOJ said. The messages claim that the consumers need only pay shipping and handling fees to receive their prize. Victims provide their credit card information and are charged for shipping and handling fees, but never receive the pr promised prize. Victims also are exposing their personal identifiable information to scammers, thereby increasing the probability of identity theft. The DOJ Office of Public Affairs recommends avoiding clicking on links received via text messages or emails claiming to be a vaccine survey if they come from unknown and unverifiable sources. The Rise of Ransomware as a Service The RASS model means that almost anyone can enter this market and leverage the coding prowess of others. The affiliates don't have to worry about building and maintaining any malware infrastructure. Each affiliate is given a custom identifier code similar to how the legit programs work. This ensures that the affiliate is given credit and collects the appropriate commissions for their attacks. In a nutshell, the various RAS groups can be categorized into three groups. 1. Emerging screws that are just getting started and have just a few notable incidents. These include Exorcist, Lolkeg, and Rush. 2. Rising power centers which have had successful attacks and maintain blogs that advertise their services and shame their victims. This group includes Darkseid, Thanos, and Klopp. 3. Top-tier organizations that have had numerous and well-publicized attacks and have been targeted by law enforcement, such as Drapple, Hamer, Revel, and Ryok. Darkside, which is the company that offers ransomware as a service, also has developed both Windows and Linux-based exploits. Their initial compromise of Windows PCs installs a PowerShell script that immediately deletes volume shadow copies and prepares various database and email repositories for encryption and copying off-site. The malware typically enters an organization through a compromised third-party account and tries to access a virtual desktop session. The group has had a spike in activity between October and December of 2020 when the amount of dark side sample submissions had more than quadrupled. Past ransom demands have ranged from 200,000 to 2 million, depending on the size of the compromised organizations. They are once again picking up steam in March 2021. The managed service vendor CompuCom fell victim to a dark side attack. The company eventually revealed in a fact posted to its customers that Darkseid was the suspected origin. If you are compromised by Darkseid, prepare yourself against other forms of ransomware. Ensure your backups are intact and accurate. Intensify phishing awareness and education and lock down your accounts with multi-factor authentication. Since the start of the pandemic, the threat Vector has greatly increased, and the dark side is taking full advantage of that situation.
And that wraps up this week's Avast Security News Roundup. Stay safe, stay secure. I'll see you next week. Bye-bye. You're muted. Thanks, Bob. I guess the bad guys are still working, working their way. Overtime. Overtime. <laughs> All right. Uh, all right, let me share the screen and let's let's listen. To, this is really a good. Dewey did a really good job on this. He always does a good job. But this is uh, very interesting. Let's see what he has to say. Good morning, friends. This is Dewey, and my tech talk topic for today is lidar, which you heard about in February. I'll expand on it a little bit. AR, which is augmented reality, and maps which Google feels is so ubiquitous, they can just call it maps. And then I'll be tying these, these topics together at the end. LIDAR is the acronym for Light Detection and Ranging. It's an active remote sensing system that uses light in the form of pulsed laser to, mention, uh, to measure distances. These laser light pulses and other data points generated by the system create accurate 3D information about objects and their environment by taking zillions of precise time measurements. Hughes Aircraft Company built the first LiDAR prototype in 1961, and a decade later in 1971, the Apollo 15 mission used LiDAR to map parts of the surface of the moon. Two basic categories of LiDAR are airborne and terrestrial. LiDAR terrestrial mapping is considered to be unparalleled in depth and dimension for finding the distance between two objects and does so faster than radar or cameras. LiDAR is among a group of today's technologies that form the basic building blocks of automation. From basic applications in sensors to 3D printing, 3D scanning, modeling, smart cities, and so forth, LiDAR is transforming the world in many ways. Well, how about consumer applications? Back in February, guest presenter Bill James told us about the WISE robotic vacuum cleaner that uses LiDAR technology to map the area in the home to be vacuumed before its first time use, and then it remembers it for the future. Several weeks later, our security guy, Bob G., uh, you know, security Bob, demonstrated his new WISE robotic vacuum cleaner and demonstrated its elegant LiDAR mapping technology. For those of you who might not know, WISE is a home products company that was founded by former Amazon employees. Their products may be purchased from Amazon or directly at WISE.com. <clears throat> LiDAR is the core technology that makes autonomous vehicles possible and has significantly, try it again, and has significantly changed the field of land surveying forever. And it allows archaeologists to create models that were impossible to create early. I said nearly, but they were impossible to create. In 2018, stunning 3D images of an ancient Mayan city in Guatemala were revealed when LiDAR digitally removed the forest canopy to reveal these ancient ruins. Unbelievable. AR is the acronym for augmented reality. Augmented reality is an enhanced image or environment as viewed on a screen or other display and is produced by overlaying computer generated images, sounds or other data on a real world environment. It's a technology that enables the user to view virtual content just, might it, just like it might exist or would have existed in the real world. Using point cloud, LiDAR adds to the AR experience. So what is LiDAR point cloud? Point clouds are huge sets of points that describe an object or surface. With the help of drone technology, LiDAR can also be used indoors to scan an area and record its data points, which produces a point cloud that's used to create a 3D model. That's how it works. So why am I telling you all about this stuff? Well, it's because Jay Peters reported in TheVerge.com on March 30th, a few days ago, that Google recently announced that it will be making some big upgrades to directions in maps including a new tool to help with indoor navigation. 
We haven't had that before. This is big, I predict. Google also announced that it's bringing its live view AR directions, augmented reality directions, to airports, transit stations, and malls. Live view directions let you hold your phone up, point your camera at the world around you, and see arrows and icons pointing you in the direction you need to go. I'm sure many of you didn't even know that you have live view in your Google Maps, but it's there especially for walking tours. In the event you're not familiar with Live View and Maps, I'll help you. To access Live View on your Android phone or tablet, first enter a destination in the search bar or tap it on a map, and then tap Directions. Above the map in the Travel Mode toolbar, toolbar, we'll say that again, Travel Mode toolbar, tap Walking. At the bottom center of your screen, tap Live View. That's it, you're there. By the way, Live View should be available to most I.O. users using Maps as well. Finding it is similar, but just enough different that a search for instructions may be warranted. Map users will need to practice patience in waiting for the rollout of indoor navigation. Live View augmented reality indoors will be slowly but surely growing in coverage in the coming years. At this time, Live View AR is only available in some malls in Chicago, Long Island, Los Angeles, Newark, San Francisco, San Jose, and Seattle. Internationally, Google will launch indoor live view, indoor live view in directions in, tra we'll try that again. Internationally, Google will, will launch indoor live view directions in select transit stations, airports, and malls in Tokyo and Zurich in the coming months and more cities are on the way, the company says. Google is also planning to revamp the interface for picking your mode of transportation for directions on Android and iOS devices. Currently, map user, Maps users have to toggle through different tabs to see more detail about different transportation options, but with a new interface that's coming soon, you'll just scroll through a list. Google says Maps will even be able to prioritize the modes you prefer and put those that are popular in certain cities, you know, like the subway in New York, for example, higher up on the list. This new interface is set to roll out globally in the next several months. In addition to the directions interface, Google is adding a new type of driving route that's optimized for local fuel consumption. Environmentalists will love that. If the eco-friendly route has about the same ETA, you know, estimate, estimated time of arrival, as the fastest route to a location, maps will default to the more fuel-efficient route, though you can change that in the settings if you like. Google plans to make these new fuel-efficient routes available on Android and iOS in the U.S. later this year. Google also plans to pilot a new grocery store pickup tool this summer with select Portland, Oregon, based locations of the Kroger-owned grocery store chain, Fred Meyer. The tool lets you share your location and estimated time of arrival with the store via maps so that your grocery order can be ready when you arrive. I'm writing this tech talk on April 1st, and I suspected it was an April Fool's Day joke when I read the headline, Microsoft killed Cortana, and no one will miss her. Happily, it was not an April Fool's joke. Cortana is gone. Yay! I've read that in the game universe, all AI, artificial intelligence programs, lose control of their faculties at the seven-year mark. Kind of weird. Since real life imitates art, Cortana, the digital assistant, will shut down just about seven years after her debut. Finally, shortly before this time next Monday, uh, when our TFS meeting begins, Joanne and I will be leaving our son's home in Superior, Colorado and driving back to our Minnesota home. Now, if my Verizon phone's hotspot cooperates, it could be the first time that a TFS regular member participant will have taken part in a TFS Zoom meeting while riding in a car. We'll see if it happens. Thankfully, my wife, Joanne, is a good driver. Well, that's my Tech Talk story for today, and I'm sticking with it. Thanks for watching. Stay safe and have a great day.
Well, thanks so much, um, Dewey. That's that's going to be great. Uh, I'm sure glad Joanne's driving though. That's that's uh, that's going to be good. That's another uh, story I don't want to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> Ray, are you ready to go? Yes, sir. Let's get share my screen here. All right, this morning I'm going to talk about what I had no idea even existed a, a month and a half ago. It's a new form format for solid state drives, and it's called the M.2. And once again, this is computer storage drives becoming smaller and faster. So just a real brief, brief history of storage drives that have transitioned over the years. In the beginning, the old line hard disk drive, 3.5 inch, uh, that has lasted, think about it, for more than 35 years. I can remember working in an office atmosphere in the late 80s when we got our first hard drive on a computer and it was 40 megabytes. And we all talked about it and said, how will we ever use that much space? And that capacity, as we all know, for the typical home user now has grew to four terabytes and larger. Those were old dri hard drives, magnetic heads, spinning platters at either 5,400 or 7,200 RPM often resulted in failure over time. And then the 2.5 inch hard disk drive was created because that smaller size was initially wonderful to be placed in laptops. And that evolved into the 2.5 inch solid state drive with no moving parts. Now the M.2 drive became available about five years ago. But except for enterprise systems and ultrabooks, uh, it was really considered too expensive for typical home users. So when I was teaching at the local college, I would often tell my students, electronics is the only industry I can think of where each year the products get better, yet cost less. Right? Think about that. Anyway, this is what happened with the M.2 drive. And now the consumer can begin to benefit from the physical and to internal advantages of this format. So it's a smaller size with faster read and write speeds. Now today the M.2 solid drive is readily available as a storage device option in new computers. Now look at that from that picture, you can see that this form factor resembles a stick of gum. It's considerably smaller than the 2.5 inch solid state drive. And it plugs directly into the motherboard like a memory stick. This provides faster read and write speeds and eliminates the need for power and data cables. Now it's adaptable too. It now achieves its fastest speeds when directly connected to the motherboard. But if you really wanted to buy one now and use it on an older desktop, uh, you could use a PCIe interface adapter or even an external enclosure that would be connected to an available USB 3.1 port. So I did a performance test now on a regular solid state drive versus a hard disk drive. So this is uh, what I call my music computer. I keep almost all my music on this one computer and it has two drives. It has a Samsung one terabyte, uh, 2.5 inch solid state drive. That came out with a read speed of 318 megabytes per second and a write speed of 495. And on that same laptop, with a mechanical two terabyte drive, the read speed was only 68 and a write speed of 73. So that's just in a, in a normal solid state drive versus a hard disk drive, you can see the difference in the speeds. And then I did a performance test with my old uh, desktop and this has the a little bit higher end Samsung solid state drive. And this one came up with a read speed of 541 and a write speed of 484 much, much faster than the hard disk drive. So with these faster read and write speeds, uh, this, this first, first of all, in that picture, you can see the difference in size between a 2.5 inch solid state drive and the new M.2 drive. And most 2.5 inch drives will provide read and write speeds of around 530, 500 megabytes with a SATA connection. But the M.2, when you use this, it's called the NVM Express as the controller, that can process as much as 3,500 megabytes 
per second, which is seven times faster than the SATA drive and 35 times faster than a standard hard disk drive. Now here's where size does matter. The model number tells you the physical size of the M.2 solid state drive. And all models use four numbers, and those four numbers, the first digits, first two digits are always 22. What is 22? Well, that represents the width of that new solid state drive in millimeters. The next two numbers are the length in millimeters. And you might see 80, 60, 42, 30. And that gives you the model numbers that correspond with those numbers like 2280, 2260, et cetera. The longer size provides more flash memory capacity, while the smaller size will easily fit into thin ultrabooks and other very small type computer devices. Now M.2 drives can be either SATA or NVM Express using the PCIe uh, protocol. The same physical size, but it's hard to tell maybe from this picture, but they have slightly different pin connections. Just, the thing to remember is the NVM Express has the faster read and write speeds. Now, Amazon, I just checked for the heck of it, offers uh, two M.2 drives, uh, a Samsung model, two terabyte for about $320, and a Western Digital Blue, one terabyte for about $105. So you wanna install an M.2 in an existing computer. The very and most important consideration is to determine if your motherboard has a dedicated M.2 connector slot. So the best way to find that out is to go to the computer manufacturer's website. They should be able to provide you with motherboard specifications that will answer this question. If your motherboard does not have a specific M.2 connection slot, then you don't need to go any further if you want to direct connect connectivity because you won't be able to have it. Now, depending on its type and functionality, an M.2 drive can use either the older SATA interface or this newer NVM Express that stands for Non-Volatile Memory Express Interface Protocol. If you're going to use the SATA interface, then basically it's going to be about the same speed as a 2.5-inch drive. If you want that faster speeds, then you have to make sure the M.2 that two drive can utilize the NVM Express communications protocol. So I was in the market to purchase a new computer. And so now that I learned about this, I specifically look for one with an M.2 solid state drive already installed that uses the NVMe interface protocol. I found one, I'm, I'm setting it up and I'm gonna give you more about that new computer and considerations I used in making that purchase in a future presentation. But for now, let me just suggest those that have a further interest in this, there are numerous videos on YouTube providing all the information you could want just by typing M.2 SSD in the YouTube search box. One of my favorites was provided by a entity known as PowerCert Animated Videos. The explanation is clear and they use animated videos for people like me. So it's easy to follow and understand. And the good news is it's less than seven minutes long. Thank you, folks. Thanks, Ray. That's really good information. I'm absolutely excited about your talk on your new computer and let us know how it's going. That's going to be lots of fun. Um, all right. Let's get on to spring cleaning. Bob, you're going to tell us, do we need a vacuum for this or what? You're, you're muted. <laughs> the famous words on, on Zoom. <laughs> Not really. Vacuum is not recommended for this. No. Okay. Oh. Well, that's interesting. Spring has arrived. It's also a great time to do a spring cleaning of our Windows 10 computer. A good place to start would be by uninstalling applications that you don't use. You may even find some applications that you don't know how they ever got to your computer in the first place. This tip may seem obvious, but it's a good place to start. Many apps that you install add startup programs or background system services that make your PC take longer to boot and that use resources in the background. Some programs clutter File Explorer's content menus with options. Others 
especially PC games, can just use a lot of disk space. That's fine if you use these applications and find them beneficial, but it's easy to install a large number of applications and find yourself not using them at all. To clean things up, uninstall the applications that you don't use. On Windows 10, you can head to Settings, Apps, and Features to see a list of applications that you can uninstall. You can also access the traditional uninstall or change a program pane in the classic control panel. Yes, Windows 10 still has the control panel. Once you remove those programs and apps, the next logical place is to remove browser extensions that you don't need and probably never use after installing them. Browser extensions are similar to apps and it's easy to install a bunch and find yourself not using them. However, browser extensions can slow down your web browsing and most of them have access to everything you do in your browser. That makes them a security and a privacy concern, especially if they're created by a company or individual you don't trust. Go through your web browser's installed extensions and remove ones that you don't use or trust in Google Chrome or any other browser you may be using. In Chrome, for example, click Menu, More Tools, Extensions to find them. In Mozilla Firefox, click Menu, Add-ons in Microsoft Edge, click Menu, Extensions. Once you get to them, you can get rid of them. Just select Remove. Many of the programs and apps that you've installed like to start when your system starts. So tweak your sort of program. We recommend uninstalling programs that you don't need and that you aren't using. To find the startup program controls on Windows 10, right click your taskbar in a blank spot and select Task Manager. Or you can use the shortcut keys, Control, Shift, and Escape. Click the Startup tab. And if you don't see it, click More Details first. You can also find a similar tool at Settings, Apps, Startup. Disable any programs that you don't want running at boot time. Many of them will not be necessary. Bear in mind that this may impact functionality. For example, if you choose not to run Microsoft OneDrive or Dropbox at boot, then they won't launch and synchronize your files automatically. You will have to open them after the computer's startup process is completed for that to happen. The more things you have running when the system starts, the slower the boot time and the more resources are being used. So choose those programs that start at boot wisely. Organize your desktop and files. Spring cleaning isn't just about making your PC run faster. It's also about making you faster at using it. Cleaning up your messy desktop is a big part of that. And if you don't want to clean up your desktop, consider just hiding your desktop icons, which you can do easily by right-clicking your desktop and unchecking View Show Desktop Icons. Beyond that, consider opening File Explorer and organizing your personal files and folders. There's a good chance that your download folder, in particular, needs a cleanup or just some quick delete of old downloads that you no longer need. Whichever folder you use frequently, consider pinning them to the quick access sidebar in File Explorer for easier access to your stuff. Clean up your taskbar and start menu. While you're at it, consider pruning or reorganizing your taskbar icons. If your taskbar is full of icons for applications that you don't need, 
unpin them by right-clicking them and selecting Unpin from the taskbar. Rearrange them with drag and drop to reposition them wherever you like on the taskbar. Look at customizing your Start menu too. Windows 10's default Start menu is packed with shortcut tiles that you probably don't even use. If you never customized it, now's a good time to ensure that only the programs you use are pinned to its tiles area. Tidy up your browser and its bookmarks. You probably spend a lot of time in your computer's web browser. If you use its bookmark feature, consider taking some time to reorganize your bookmarks in a way that makes sense. It's easiest to do this from your browser's bookmarks manager, rather than fiddling with the bookmarks toolbar. In Google Chrome, click Menu, Bookmarks, Bookmark Manager to launch it. Consider backing up your bookmark before continuing, in case you want them again in the future. Run Disk Cleanup to free up space. If you want to clean up some temporary files and free up some disk space, try using the Disk Cleanup tool built into Windows. On Windows 10, open the Start menu, search for Disk Cleanup using the search box, and click Disk Cleanup to launch it. Click the Clean Up System Files button to ensure that you're cleaning up both your Windows User Accounts files and system-wide files. Depending on how long it's been since you last ran this tool, you may be able to free up gigabytes of unnecessary files. For example, files related to old Windows updates. Look carefully through the list of things that Disk Cleanup plans to delete to ensure that the tool doesn't delete anything that you want to keep. Dust out your PC. If you have a desktop PC, you should be opening it regularly and giving it a quick dust. Be sure to turn the PC off first. Dusting your laptop may also be necessary. Dust often builds up in your PC's fan and in other components, reducing their cooling effectiveness. As a result, your PC may run hotter, or at least the fan will have to work harder to provide the same amount of cooling. While you don't have to go crazy in thoroughly cleaning every part of your PC, we do recommend powering off your PC and cleaning it with compressed air. Never use a vacuum for this. You should also clean your dirty keyboard, monitor, and more. Dust on the inside of the PC can affect performance and cooling but there's probably dust elsewhere too. On the screen, on your computer's motherboard, in between the keys on your keyboard, and more. Spring cleaning is a great time to do a nice deep clean. To clean your monitor, all you need is a standard microfiber cloth, the same kind you use to wipe a pair of eyeglasses. To deep clean your keyboard, you can generally remove the keys and use compressed air or a vacuum to clean out the accumulated debris. You might also just turn the keyboard upside down if it's not part of the laptop. Sometimes lots of stuff comes out of it you didn't even know was in that keyboard. Unmute yourself. Ron, you're Unmute muted. It, Ron. Thought I, am, I hit the button. There you go. Thanks, Bob. I guess the wise vacuum isn't going to do that for us, eh? Especially not on remote control. <laughs> All right. Uh, Bob, there was a couple of questions in the chat. I'm going to defer those for the question and answer so, so yep. uh, Ray can get into his music segment now. Is that okay with you? Fine and, with me. Uh, 
Yep, great. I want to thank everyone on the uh, live stream that uh, from YouTube that has joined us. Uh, there's a bunch of people over there watching. Uh, thanks very much for coming, and we will see you again next week, the same time, same place. For the rest of us, we now have the enjoyment of Ray's music segment. Uh, Ray, do you want to take it away? Yes, sir. So let me just uh, get rid of this one. All right, Judy, Judy, Judy. That's the famous movie quote attributed to Cary Grant, which he actually did not say, but that's another story for another time. Today, I'd like to highlight one of my favorite female folk singers of the 1960s. And when you consider how many years Judy Collins has been an active recording artist, since her debut LP, A Maid of Constant Sorrow, was released in 1961. It is not surprising the volume of recordings she has accumulated. She was born in Seattle in 1939, moved with her family when she was 10 years old to Colorado. Her musical career started as a child piano prodigy. But by the time she graduated high school, her instrument of choice was the guitar and playing not only traditional folk songs, but also the current day topical ones inspired by the likes of Pete Seeger and Bob Dylan. But Collins was not content to stay in the folk genre. And in 1966, released the LP, In My Life. That included the album title song written by Lennon and McCartney, as well as Leonard Cohen's Suzanne. My two favorite Judy Collins songs, both were written by Canadian songwriters. Both Sides Now was written by singer Joni Mitchell, but first recorded by Collins, and Someday Soon was written by Ian Tyson from his Ian and Sylvia days. You know, I always like to give a little bit of trivia when I can. So for about two years, Judy was romantically involved with Stephen Stills of Crosby, Stills, Nash, and sometimes Young fame. Uh, Stills could sense Judy was about to break up with him and was inspired to write the song Sweet Judy Blue Eyes. Now, I did not misspell sweet. That's actually this title of the song, kind of a play on the word sweet. And he wrote that song hoping to change her mind. Well, it didn't. So I'm going to show you now a performance of Judy Collins. This is less than five years ago, and where amazingly, her voice has hardly changed over the last 50 years. A little bit more and make sure I optimize for the video clip. Hope that was good. One of my great. favorite songs. That's great. That was really, uh, that's really good, Ray. Thanks so much. Yeah, she's amazing at her age. Well, you know, you probably saw in the news feed this morning that uh, William Shatner's 90 years old. Eh? They had him, they were interviewing him and he's, he looked like he did when he was 60. I mean, it was, it was amazing and really, truly amazing how some people age. Uh, crazy. Eh? Yeah. Good genes. Yes. All right. Well, that's great. Um, well, so thanks everyone for coming. It's top of the hour. Uh, we're going to move into our question and answer period now. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, we will see everybody again next week, the same time, the same place. I'll see if I can get our Facebook feed sorted out. Um, and we'll see if we can work on that. Huey, you're going to have your big uh, WinSig next uh, next Sunday, right? Yes, and I did put in the chat a link where they can sign up and get a link uh, for the actual program and get some information as well. Okay, great. And uh, we'll be seeing you on Thursday, right? Absolutely. And Bob, are we are we any more cleaning we got to do? You're you're muted. <laughs> I mute it because I don't want to sing and have everybody hear me when Ray is playing his music. <laughs> we just about cleaned out now, or do you got any more cleaning plan for us? No, right now it's working overtime already. Okay, <laughs> all, right. all right, that's good. And Ray, uh, next week we're gonna, or is it next week you'll have? Uh, we're gonna hear about your new computer. Is that is that the plan? I will do my best to have it ready. I'll let you know in a day or two, but I'm, that's what you want. That's what we'll get. Thanks so much. 
and uh, and Dewey, we will wish you safe travels in your uh, your trip home. Uh, please uh, don't speed and uh, let Joanne drive. Yes, I'll tell Joanne not to speed. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thanks so much. Hopefully we'll hear from you. That'd be really cool if we can uh, talk to you as you're in the car driving along. We'll, we'll be able to see, uh, you can give us a, hi, Joanne. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good. Uh, now we're gonna move into the, uh, for those, so we'll call it uh, an end for the program, but uh, we'll now move into the question and answer um, segment. And again, if you could, uh, at the bottom, you'll see that under reactions, you'll see a little button there. Uh, and if you click that, you can raise your hand. Uh, Bob, I had one question uh, in our chat. Um, and the question was, um, if you could answer this, the, uh, no, Joel asked, many of the programs and browser extensions have names I do not recognize. How do I know if it's safe to remove these programs? How do I know if, if and how they might impact functionality of my system? Best advice I can give is Google is your friend. If you don't like Google, use one of the other search engines, but just phrase it like you would any other question, just in plain English, and there'll be lots of answers. I remember thing. addressing this several years ago, and I found that bleepingcomputer.com seemed to have an answer every time I had a doubt whether or not to, to delete a program. Right, um, but we're, I guess if, if we're talking about browser extensions, in your extensions menu in Chrome, it's easy just to turn it off. So you have a worry that it's going to affect, uh, affect your, uh, how your, your computer is working you can just turn it off and play, you know, and leave it run for a week with it off. And if you don't, if you don't notice any difference, then you can, uh, then you could remove it then. Most of the browser extensions sit on top of the operating system and don't actually uh, aren't embedded into like a program in Windows 10, they sit on top. So it's really not an issue if you remove them. And also if you remove them, you can also reinstall them. The only issue is some of the, some of the extensions create data files if they're doing certain things. So um, you might lose something if you, if you remove it. But by and large, my advice would be just to turn them off for a little while and see if you really miss them. If you don't, then just get rid of them. But Bob's absolutely right. I mean, it's amazing how many of these things you keep getting and you think it's great because you, you listen to us and we say, this is a great thing to try. You, you install it and you use it and then you never really use it that much. So so good idea. <laughs> Um, let's have a look on the top here. Uh, Murray, you have a, Murray, you have a question? Okay, well, I have a, I have a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, an a part of an answer to the extension one that you just were talking about. And uh, that one, uh, most of the extensions, if you look at them on the, you know, go over to your extensions uh, menu in Chrome or whatever, it will describe what it is and what it does. And then that will help you decide whether or not you need it. The other thing I want to do, I was trying to put a picture in the chat, but I don't think I could do that. Um, so I was going to show a picture of my um, NAS server that I that I built with my Raspberry Pi. Maybe if I can share the screen for a minute, that would. Can I share the screen? Yeah, let me do it. You know what I'd really like you to do is, can't you do a little 10 minute talk on it? I asked you that before. Yeah, I this will. Okay, uh, two weeks from now. All right, let's 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 leave it with that, Marie. You okay. you you put something together for, and, and then give me a call. I think it's so cool. And I think that would be a better time is if we allocated some time. Now we're just you. gonna show a quick picture of it. Uh, let me see. Let's 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 hold off on that because that's gonna okay. Get you. Okay, I'll show it next time. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jim Jim Copeland. Ron, can you tell us a bit more about your other new piece of technology? Oh, you want to know about my new e-bike? Well, I bought a I bought a uh, an e-bike uh, on uh, most recently, and uh, it was uh, I've been having a lot. Well, I've only been out in it three times. Uh, and it's uh, it's it's really cool, and it's and it's really nice for seniors because 
you know, at, when you're almost, um, I'm what, 68, and uh, when you're trying to get up a hill and trying to move around, it isn't, uh, it's, it's getting more and more difficult, right? So the, uh, so this little sucker is like a motorcycle, it goes like stink. And, uh, you know, I can, I don't even have to work up a sweat or get my heart rate up, you know? What's the brand? <laughs> What's the brand? The, the brand is called Volt, V-O-L-T bike, B-I-K-E. Uh, for those of you in the States, I'm, I'm not sure that this is a, this is made out of Burnaby, uh, not Burnaby, but Port Coquitlam in, in, out of Vancouver. And it's a direct sales uh, to the, uh, to the consumer. So it, they're very popular. Lots of people use them. Uh, and it's, uh, I've had a, I've had a blast with it. Uh, I'll, I'll post some pictures and you can have, I was thinking maybe doing a bit of a talk on it as well. It is an interesting exercise technology for seniors. I mean, it, it does, does work very well. Why so. don't you do something with your VR? Uh, I am, <laughs> I am, I am, I'm working on it. I've got four, four presentations that I'm working on. Trust me guys, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, honest. Uh, but by the way, I decided that, uh, you know, I was thinking of ordering that wise vacuum and having said to my cousin, and you were talking about me getting to order one for you. I decided I'm trying to get rid of stuff, not buy more stuff. <laughs> Joel has his hand up. Joel, go ahead. You're muted. Mute. Okay, Bob, continuing on your presentation and obviously others with experience can chime in. Um, we all want to avoid ransomware. We have all started with Avast as a protection package. Is there something else we should be doing besides the very nominal of don't open any email, you don't know what it is, don't click on extensions, you're not terribly sure of, but how I've been fortunate, I have not seen ransomware attack me that I know of. Um, how do I protect myself from being hit by that lousy bug? Probably because Avast already has something in it that protects you against ransomware. Maybe that's why you haven't seen anything. I haven't either. But that's part of the protection built into Avast. Even the free version is a module specifically designed against ransomware. I'm willing to buy. I realize you're not a salesman for Avast and you have a very special position with them. Um, but I'm willing to pay for good product, good services, and I don't mean to be uh, the term in Yiddish is it's called a schnorr. Um, do I gain more protection by purchasing the professional, the step-up version? Against ransomware, no. It's the same protection in the free version as in the paid version. That's a module that's already built in. There are many other things that you can get that you have to pay for. Ransomware protection is already built in, whether it's free or paid. Thank you for your continued support and information. You're welcome. <laughs> All right, great. One thing you can't buy, common sense. Common sense is not very common. <laughs> very good. All right, Greg, go ahead. Yeah, Starlink. I just uh, ran a speed check and it was 28. So I ran it again and now it's 171 with my upload speed of 11. So what we're seeing, Greg, is a lot of fluctuation in the uh, speed. Is that is that what you're finding? Yeah, but I don't check it all the time. Right. Okay. Well, um, we will continue. Thank for you. Thanks for your um, continued update. Um, so I wonder if it, the interest just I suggest you check if your computer is talking to the internet by Wi-Fi, are you switching between speeds of Wi-Fi? I've had mm -hmm. friends and such who don't realize it, and sometimes they're on 2.4 Wi-Fi, and sometimes they're on 5 Wi-Fi, and obviously that has a major difference on internet speed. Now, I'm on uh, Starlink, and it's 5G's. Thanks. And then Chris, Chris uh, Rosinski. Yeah. Um, 
you asked earlier what people were getting out of the Thursday show. And I think the apps and things you shared were invaluable, but I would kind of like to request some more detailed of uh, you, you, the three of you talked about how you organize and keep track of, I think it was your podcast and your feeds. And, and I think Dewey said something about the, uh, getting an abstract of each one of those things so that you could, you could keep track of them better. And so, uh, uh, I, sorry about the phones or any other, in the other side of the room. Uh, anyway, I'd like to, like to request more details of that coming on maybe one of these shows or again on Thursday. That's it. Okay. Yeah, that's that's very good. Uh, one of the things that I want everyone to um, uh, remember is that uh, is our Facebook news Facebook feed. Um, <clears throat> now we have a face, as you know, Tech for Senior has a Facebook page, and Bob, Huey, and I post uh, continuous articles all day long to that page, and these are these are technology articles that we have previewed and deemed to be interested to you. And so, uh, and we have now a huge number of people um, that, are, that are following the page on a regular basis. So it is a service we provide. So I would encourage you, uh, it became real evident. I was giving a talk this last week and uh, I was um, at a club and someone asked me and said, you know, I read three newspapers a day and all the stuff you talked about today, I have no idea what you were talking about. And I thought, well, that's interesting. They're obviously not getting technology articles in the newspapers they're reading. So just remember, uh, don't forget about our Facebook page because a lot of what we talk about today, and Chris, why I mentioned this is because as I read through all the articles I see in a day, I fire them all over to our Facebook page, the, the, the ones that I think you guys might be interested in. So uh, don't, forget, don't forget about our Facebook page. Roma. You get to ask ask a question. This is great. Ro Roma is our uh, she, it's her first time on the show today. So uh, do you have to unmute yourself now? Just just uh, do you know how to do that? Yes. Okay. There you Can go. You hear Thank, me? Thanks so much. I have, I have two questions. Three really. Sorry, they're increasing. Okay. One is uh, while I have a Facebook account, I never use Facebook. Never. I have never in my life used it. That's so. Can I watch Facebook? your Facebook page without actually going into my own account as it were? Yes, the answer to that question is, is it, you, you'll have to be logged into Facebook. So you'll have to, but you don't actually have to go to your account. You'll just uh, bring up our Facebook page. A Facebook page is not like your profile. When you go okay. and you have, a, you have a Facebook profile, that's where you get all the social chats that you have. Exactly. And, you know, and that's where everyone's showing their kids and their mothers and their blah, blah, you know, goes on and on and on. But the, um, but a Facebook page is a business page. It's a, it's, it's not social, it's not social media. It is like our website. Okay. It's like a website and it is specific to, and we, and the only three people that can post on our Facebook page are Bob, um, myself and Huey, right? No one else can post. We're the only people that can, can post anything to that page. So, so you're only going to be getting specific um, information on that. So just bookmark it. Just, just, just um, you'll see the link on our newsletter. Uh, just, just bookmark the page, and that's all you have to do if you want to see it. Just click the click your bookmark, and it'll take you right to the page. Yeah, you will have so to do sign I, in. Do to... I get? Uh, am I right? That means I go through my Facebook. I have a page, but I don't use it. Or do I go to your site and click through Facebook? Well, you'll have to log on. You'll have to actually, um, you'll, you, you know, you'll have to actually be into Facebook. You have to log on to Facebook, and then, um, and then you'll, you'll, uh, you can just click the link, and it'll take you right to our page. Right. You don't have to. Once you sign in, all you have to do then is is look at any pages. You don't have to post anything. You know, no one will okay. see that you've even been on. Right. But uh, you do have to log in with your account. Uh, in Facebook. And then once you oh, get Lord. to the Tech for Senior page, make sure you follow it. And that way, anytime anything is posted, it will come up on your timeline. Okay. And I have it on my Android phone, and it's always logged in. So do I, what do I do? I don't remember the password. I mean, that's oh. a feeling. Uh, if you're always already logged in, don't worry about it. <laughs> you'll, you'll, yeah, you'll just... yeah. And one, once you, you've, uh, start following the Tech for Senior uh, uh, Facebook page, it will 
be in your timeline on your phone. Oh, as perfect. Well. Perfect. So you don't have to do I, anything. Thank you so much. I have one more question. I have an Android phone. And in a moment of madness, I downloaded a scanner from Google, Google Play Store. Um, it didn't work very well, needless to say. But um, then I find it creeps up suddenly and it seems to be scanning with a mind of its own. So when I try to uninstall it, it wouldn't get uninstalled. Is there something I can do? Um, and this is on your Android phone? Yes, sir. The try shutting down your phone and then starting it back up and then try to uninstall it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. That's a good good suggestion, yeah. In other words, reboot. Reboot and then that, try. Yeah. Reboot. And so there's one more. I have a game that came uh, bloatware with the phone and it's something called Game Turbo. I don't play games. So I've been trying to uninstall it Again, it refuses to get uninstalled. I, I think I the, the I think the same the same okay. answer to that would be would be to re restart your phone and it okay. apps directly go directly yeah. into your your apps after that and you'll be able to uninstall. Yeah, it. you should be able to uninstall it. Yep. Okay, I'll do that. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, Murray, you had I, a. I wonder too. Question? I wonder too on that issue. Are you deleting it from the home page or from the apps page? Because you can delete the shortcut and not the app. Oh. Uh, but you have to go into the settings, then go to your apps, and from oh. there, delete it. OK. Right. Okay. You, yeah, but you're going to, but on an Android, we're, we're talking about on an Android, we're talking about yeah. an Android phone, which you shouldn't have. There shouldn't be shortcuts on an Android phone, eh? There are on the home yeah. pages. On the home page, you have the shortcut. You have to go into settings and then go into oh, okay. go the into apps, apps and then remove and okay. then delete it from the. Okay. 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 Thank you, Murray. Mm -hmm. Murray, go ahead. Okay, I have a, a question. I'm afraid I know the answer, but um, is there any way in Facebook to completely stop all the <laughs> requests for 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 people to to you know you, you get this all these thousands of friends requests or whatever is there any way to completely yes. disable that in facebook and be a hermit well yes. i mean uh, the only people i mean if i want to join if i want somebody to be my friend uh quote i will rather search for them and add them i don't want to know these Thousands Absolutely. of friends of friends and friends of friends of friends who keep coming up and cluttering up everything. I believe there's a setting in Facebook that you can uh, adjust who can ask for friends, and you can, I think, almost turn that up, turn that off. Okay. Well, if 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 sometime maybe somebody can show how to do that, that would be an interesting topic. Yes. How to yes, turn please. off those things from Facebook would be a wonderful suggestion posted a whole bunch of privacy tutorials and yes, there are quite please. a few of them on Facebook and they cover lots of things. Okay, well, uh, that's the trouble with probably 3,000 and most of them are useless. <laughs> and the other problem is Facebook changes stuff on a regular basis. Yep. And if you watch something, it may be older and it may not be the way to do it today. So uh, that's yeah, the same with right. Google, eh? Yep. Well, same with anything. And and of course, Google now it's going to be really a pain uh, once they get rid of uh, hang hang out. What is it? Hang out hang out yep. dialer because uh, the the uh, uh, replacement is not available anywhere but in the United States. I'm only here in the U.S. So yeah, yeah. But right. Ron and I aren't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, actually, Murray, it's 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 the, the um, we're and I'll probably do a video on this as well. But I'm getting a lot of heat about getting my other videos on um, virtual reality. So I've got to I got to work hard at this. But uh, in fact, um, I downloaded, installed. Uh, well, no, I just turned it on. And um, if you use Gmail, uh, there's a new feature I that do. came out today, and you can turn that on. And it's the new chat feature 
which will incorporate the uh, old hangouts. So oh, the old okay. hangouts is going away. Yeah. And, no, if, and as of today, and I and I turned it on this morning. I haven't played with it yet. I'm going to probably maybe play Bob and I might uh, uh, or Huey will will do a do that. But it's a it's a just go into your settings in Gmail and you can turn that on. Okay. And, and does that see. let you call uh, regular phones? Um, calls? I mean, I'm that's not, what Hangouts is good. I mean, that's what I like using Hangouts for is yeah. so that I don't have to pay for any airtime. Yeah, I, I've I'm been not, using Google to, Voice for years. Yeah, yeah, I know, but we can't we can't do that in Canada. Yeah, Google so, Voice is not available in Canada. No, no, no. only in the That's U.S. Good. Yeah, well, so I don't know. We'll have to. I'll have my to, Google Voice number. Yeah, I'll have to, Murray. I'll have to um, play around with that. But 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 you can um, now if you're where you are now, you can enable that in the. Yeah, uh, and I could probably contact people using Google, but I doubt if I can phone make phone calls with it. The landlines right if you have a phone why not use the phone well uh i have a uh, uh i have a really cheap plan right now it costs me approximately oh about six dollars a year uh no wow. sixty dollars uh no yeah about 50 83 dollars a year for uh for what i use it for but i almost never never make phone calls magic jack is 39.95 gives you a whole year's worth of calling includes the u.s canada mexico and if you take it with you overseas you can also call anybody here in the u.s or you at uh, canada or and that's 39.95 and that works right on here. your uh on your cell phone not only that, uh, you can you can install the app and run it on your Chromebook and have yep. uh, eleven or fourteen inch screen yeah. as a phone. And there's There's an app on your there's an app on your uh, on your cell phone as well, a Magic Check app. Yep. Yeah, and again, that I guess you need to be connected with Wi-Fi to use it. Yeah. Boy. Yeah. All right. Yep. Listen, it's uh, twenty. It's uh, oh, Chris, do you want the one final quick word? You got your hand up. Do you have something to say? You will have yeah. the last. I, I just have a, a quick comment the lady was talking about the deleting apps. When you go to delete the apps from your settings, uh, you may find that some of the apps can't be deleted. And so what you do with those is you can disable them. And if you disable them, then you don't have to die. When it's disabled, it doesn't accept all the updates and things. So if you don't want it and you can't get rid of it, then you disable it. And that will just, and the people are paying to have those apps on your, your phone. And so that's why they're not being able to be, be dis, de, deleted, but you can disable them anyway. That was just my point. Thanks, Thank Chris. You so much. Thanks, Chris. Uh, so um, remember, everyone, if you want to come and have coffee with uh, <laughs> Huey, Bob, um, and uh, myself on Thursday morning at nine o'clock Pacific time, uh, bring your own coffee. We will sit around and have a have a chat, and and it'll be broadcast to Facebook and uh, YouTube as well. Uh, that we did last week because we use a great program uh, called Streamyard. If you do not use Streamyard, uh, we have talked about that in the past, but it's free. Uh, we did purchase a license for Streamyard now, so uh, we can have up to ten people on the stream with us. Uh, so we're going to invite some people for coffee you, sometime. We haven't purchased. figured this all out yet. You purchased. Yeah. Oh, we did. You did. <laughs> yeah. All right. I purchased. I purchased the uh, the license. So we will. Uh, we can have people coming for coffee. I thought it'd be nice to have invite some people for coffee. So we're going to think about that. Uh, and um, what else can I tell you? Well, I guess yeah. It's it's time. It's uh, it's uh, twenty minutes after. We will see everybody uh, same time, same place next week. Uh, thanks, Bob, for being here. Thanks, Huey. Uh, thanks, Dewey. Thanks, um, Ray. Mm -hmm. Thanks, thank everyone for all the work they did today. And thank you for coming and listening to us today. Maybe we'll see you on Thursday. If we don't catch you on Thursday, we will see you next Monday. All right. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.